Hello everyone, welcome to Ask Sheets Education Expo. Today we will be learning about report writing, do it right. Before introducing our esteemed presenter and having him take over, just a few reminders. All participants are muted, but you can submit your questions through the feature available on this webinar. These questions will be seen and if time allows, answered by the presenter at the end of the presentation. This and all presentations in the series are being recorded and are available on the ASHI Online Learning Center that is free to all ASHI members as part of membership. Please allow one week after the webinar ends to access on the portal. In addition to these webinars, there are over 140 courses in technical and business subjects available to all ASHI members. You will receive two ASHI CEUs for participating in this webinar and will receive a certificate stating that after this webinar ends. There will also be a short four question survey. Please take the time to respond. I want to now introduce our presenter. Alan Carson lives home inspections since he co-founded Carson Dunlop and Associates Limited in 1978 with Robert Dunlop. He has focused his professional life on the development of this young profession. Over 42 years, Carson Dunlop has, has performed hundreds of thousands of home inspections, helped to train thousands of inspectors, and provided the reporting system for millions of inspections. Alan has helped grow the profession, taking a leadership role in North American associations, working with government and post-secondary institutions. Alan has served as ASHI's president in the past, and we are appreciative of the impact that he has made during his tenure and today. Uh, thank you, Alan, for taking us uh, and teaching us a little bit about report writing. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Alan. James, thanks so much. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for joining me today. Um, as James said, I'm going to try and get through my content and I'm going to encourage you to write your questions in on the chat and then we'll address the, the questions when we get through at the end uh, and we'll, we'll see how many questions we have and, and how much time we have, but uh, we'll play that a little bit by ear. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started, see if we can have some fun with this. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a rant because um, this is kind of a, a passion for me. And what I want to say is home inspection is a professional consulting practice. It's not a trade, it's not an industry. You folks make important decisions all the time with incomplete information, using deductive reasoning, and applying scientific principles. You communicate at a high level verbally and in writing. Inspection is a consulting profession, and what you folks do is special. It's complex and it's challenging. I don't think we stop and give ourselves enough credit often enough. I'm going to give you my little tongue in cheek definition of home inspection, and you can tell me whether this is a day in your life. So here's my definition of home inspection a business with illogically high liability, slim profit margins, and limited economies of scale an incredibly diverse multidiscipline consulting service delivered under difficult in-field circumstances before a highly stressed, hostile audience with differing interests in an impossibly short time frame, requiring the production of an extraordinarily detailed technical report almost instantly without benefit of research facilities or resources. Does that sound like a, a page out of your book? Let me tell you, I deal with a lot of consultants, uh, professionals, engineers, architects, technicians, technologists. There are very few that could do what you folks do and create a report that approaches yours, let alone in the time you spend. And most of them would charge more for just the report writing time than we charge for the entire inspection experience. So I did want to start with a little hats off. Now let me get on to what we're supposed to be talking about. Thank you for indulging me with that. I kind of care. So let's talk about report writing and doing it right. And I've broken this down into a few segments, so uh, uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit. Um, let's start with the fundamentals. Why do reports matter? Well, I'm going to tell you they are so helpful to clients. You think you're communicating on site, and let me tell you what the numbers say. Clients understand about 50% of what you say during an inspection, and two months later, by the time they move in, their retention is less than 5% of that. So the report matters because it becomes the client's decision-making tool, but also their reference tool once they move into the house. Secondly, we need to write reports to meet the standards. 
Um, I have some issues with most standards of practice, but we'll talk about those, but we have to play by the rules. State regulation, same thing. If you're in a regulated state and you need to have a written report, almost everybody's gonna do that. Insurers, your E&O insurance carrier is gonna want you to have a report. You've gotta manage your liability. It's the document that is gonna be referred to if push comes to shove down the road. There's also the standard of care issue, which means if all the other inspectors in your market are doing it, you've got to do it too. Lastly, I'm going to say something that not everybody thinks about. If your report is good enough, it can be a powerful marketing tool for you and can help to differentiate you in the market. So I think that is a whole bunch of reasons why we need to talk about report writing. Now, I did a session, I was talking to James and Mike before we started. I did a session a couple of weeks ago and what came out of it was, uh, how much time do people spend writing reports? And I'm gonna submit that it's a significant part of your working day. I was surprised when the numbers came back from a survey that we did that 45% of inspectors are spending more than two and a half hours writing reports on average and only 11% were spending less than an hour. So trust me when I tell you, most folks are spending a lot of time writing reports. We may as well do it really, really well. Okay, a little warning here. I'm gonna challenge you. In fact, I'm probably gonna irritate you on some points and I make absolutely no apologies for that. My goal is to have you think about what you do. And if you decide after thinking about it that what you're doing is perfect, then good for you, you've reinforced your beliefs. If I can provide something that helps you and moves the needle a little bit for you, I'll be thrilled. But again, my philosophy is just that. It's my philosophy. Yours may differ and probably will. So let's get started. I'm gonna tell you what matters to me hugely is what clients want. Not so much what my E&O carrier wants, not so much what the, my competitor across the street thinks. I really care what my clients want. And here's what they've told us. By the way, we did a survey of about 3,500 clients to make sure that we were on the right track. They want help making a big decision. In a perfect world, if you did the inspection and turned to your client and gave them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, that's probably what they want. They want you to tell them what to do. Well, we can't do that. And we also know once they moved into the house, they'd have a whole bunch of questions. So failing a thumbs up or a thumbs down solution, I think our goal is to give them simple, clear, relevant information that's gonna help them make one of the biggest financial and lifestyle decisions they're ever gonna make. Do they want fluff? Do they want filler? Do they wanna read about the inspector covering his butt? I'm gonna say not so much. So why do I see so much of it in reports? Well, never mind, we'll get to that. I'm also gonna tell you that what our clients want is a summary. They wanna see the big picture. And I have lots of discussions about client inspectors saying, oh, I don't wanna do a summary, it increases my liability, it's this, it's that, or the other. I'm gonna tell you, generally speaking, the customer is always right. The customer wants a summary. And I think you can do it, and I think it's easy to do in a way that doesn't build additional liability for you. We've been doing it for 42 years, hasn't been a problem. Secondly, the condition of the house belongs in the body of the report. Now that sounds self-evident, but it becomes important when I make the next point, which is to say your maintenance tips and your helpful advice doesn't belong in the body of the report. It belongs in a separate part of the report, maybe an appendix. Why do I say that? Because I read so many reports, by the way, I'm gonna, gonna just stop and say, to me, our clients fall into several different buckets, but a bigger and bigger bucket is the millennials. And I've got five kids who are millennials, and I am pretty confident that they are not as passionate about homes as we are. They don't know, they don't understand, and they don't care to learn. They want help, they're used to hiring people to do stuff for them, they do what they do really well, they want somebody else to do the other stuff. The home maintenance stuff is confusing to them. So when you tell them in the roofing section of the report that you need to replace the roof and it should be stripped first and this is a big deal, and then the next sentence is, and you should also clean your gutters twice a year and make sure the downspouts discharge well away from the house, 
which one of those is a big problem on this house? They think both, they think everything. They don't, they don't have the filter that you do. So I'm gonna ask you to take, if it applies to any house and it's good advice and it's helpful maintenance, take it and put it under a category that says maintenance tips or important advice for all homeowners or something that helps the client understand what, is, what are we talking about now? Okay, this is general, this is after I move in, this has helped me look after the house. This is not making my decision to buy the house. I really need you to separate those and believe me, I see so many reports where it's all intermingled and you and I can filter it and sort it out, but think about what your client needs. They can't sort it out the way we can. So step one, get rid of the junk out of your report that is true of every home. Okay, another philosophy. Um, let me preface this one by saying, I'm talking as though we are not in a COVID pandemic. I'm talking about normal times. And I understand the world is upside down and has been for a few months and is likely to be for uh, a bit longer and I hope not too much longer, but uh, I'm talking about normal times. And I am seeing more and more of my colleagues encouraging their clients not to come to the inspection until the very end, or sometimes even not at all. I don't think of it that way. We invite our clients to come to the inspection. I wanna have them there. I think of a home inspection as a two and a half hour course in home ownership. I think the communication is better and I think the relationships are stronger. Um, by the way, there's a phrase that we've been using for a very long time saying friends don't sue friends. If your client has a chance to see how hard you work getting up onto the roof, into the crawl space, how much you care about what they are doing with their lives and their home, then I think you have a much better chance of having a happy long-term relationship with the client and fewer complaints. I don't think you need to deliver reports on site. I'm seeing more and more people doing Why are we pressing ourselves to do that? because it means you can uh, drive away from the house and be done with it. Well, that's great for the inspector and that's super. And we have done reports on site, reports not on site. I can tell you, I think your work, your craft will be better if you go away from the house, sit down quietly and either write or complete or polish or proofread the report before sending it. We've been doing this for a lot of years. Our clients and agents are very happy to receive the report. We deliver it the same day as the inspection. We just don't do it on site. That has not been a challenge for us. Next point, less is more. I know home inspectors have this passion to be helpful and to share their knowledge. And I'm gonna tell you sometimes it gets in our way and we're gonna look at some examples of that. Okay, a little more on philosophy. To me, pictures are, worth at least a thousand words. And whether it's a photo like this, whether it's a well done illustration, the other thing that's great about a photo is there's no typos, there's no bad grammar, there's no poor syntax. The communication is pure and simple and elegant. Please include good photos. And we'll talk about how many and what type in a few minutes. Okay, my philosophy. The fundamental question about report writing is, does it help my client? Does every word in your report help your client? And now I'm gonna turn the world upside down a bit. I'm gonna tell you, most descriptions don't help your clients. I'm gonna say, the inventory taking role that you play is a total waste of your client's time. Very few exceptions. Why do we do it? We have to do it to meet the standards. Why do the standards ask us to do it? If you go back to the beginning of ASHI and other organizations, the standards were used by report verifiers to evaluate new members. Does this guy know what he's talking about? That's the only possible explanation you could have for why we have to put in the standards, whether the electrical service to the house is overhead or underground. How is that useful to the client? How does that help the client? I'm gonna to suggest to you not very much at all. So it is what it is. The standards are the standards. You should follow standards or state laws. And if you say you're gonna follow them, you need to follow them. So I'm not saying don't do it. We'll talk a little bit more about how to do it in a minimalist generic way to try and stay out of trouble and not waste a bunch of time for you and for your client. 
Limitations, two thoughts. Limitations don't help your clients, they're there for you. Don't repeat all the limitations in the standards in your report. Refer to them in your contract, include and attach a copy of the standards if you like, but do not repeat all the exclusions and limitations in the standards in the body of your report. The limitations in your report should be site specific. Could not inspect the rear second floor bedroom because there was a sick child in there and the uh, occupant asked us not to go in that room. Snow on the roof, something like that. Now, let's go a step further. I'm gonna tell you from a legal perspective that describing a limitation is not enough. Telling people you couldn't get in the crawl space, couldn't access the attic because it was screwed shut, something like that is not enough. I'm gonna tell you, you have to go the next step and say, we recommend that access be gained and a complete inspection done and you can do one of two or three things. Somebody else can do that inspection. You can offer to do that inspection for a fee. You can offer to do it as a courtesy to uh, enhance and build your business, up to you. But please don't put in limitations and leave them at that. Understand when the client starts to read your limitations, they tune out because they it doesn't add any value for them. So you need to bring it back into the recommendations and tell them, you need to get access. You need to, if the utilities are, you need to get the electricity turned on so we can check the electrical system. That is important, okay? Make it a recommendation, not just a check a box, couldn't do it. So I'm gonna say to the client, your descriptions and your limitations are a necessary evil. They have absolutely no value to your clients. So far you have added nothing to their lives. So. Keep it short, keep it sweet, be generic, do what you have to do and not a bit more for your benefit and your clients. I'm gonna talk about a tool we use in Horizon called SpeedWrite and I suspect other software has something similar, but I'm gonna talk what I know about. And so to me, we have set up a tool that allows you to enter the descriptions and limitations at lightning speed, get it set up once. It's a quality assurance tool It pulls it out of you, make sure you check each box, but it auto advances for you. So there's no more navigation, no scrolling, no uh, clicking around, looking for the right thing. It just auto advances every screen. You click a box and it moves on to the next one. It's done. We'll talk about that. I'll show you a screenshot. Um, use a tool like that to get this noise and necessary evil off of your plate as quickly as you can. Let's move on to recommendations. This is what does matter. This is why people get a home inspection. Our focus needs to be on the recommendations and the message needs to be delivered clearly, simply, and consistently. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Okay, here's what I'm gonna tell you that I think should be part of every recommendation you make. And I'm also gonna say your software should make it easy to do that by guiding you through it. I look at so many reports where for one defect, the writer goes into chapter and verse description, and on the next one, there is important stuff missing. There's no consistency lever. There is no methodology. There is no flow to the report. I'm gonna tell you that when it comes to writing up a defect or a deficiency, and by the way, we don't use either of those words. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We say, what's the component? What is it? What's the problem? What's the condition? Why does it matter to the client? Where's the problem? What do I do and when? So I call it KILT, C-C-I-L-T-T, -T, Component, Condition, Implication, Location, Task, and Time, okay? You can think of it as a sentence, although we prefer bullet points because that's what our clients asked for in the survey. Easier, simpler for you to write, no grammar errors, easier and simpler for your client to understand. So if I take those points that I uh, described and put them into a report narrative, I would say the asphalt single roof covering is worn out and will leak, causing damage to the structure and contents. The house and garage roof should be replaced immediately. So component, asphalt single roofing, condition, worn out. Implications, will leak, causing damage. Location, house and garage roof. Task, replace. Time, immediately. Get the idea? 
every recommendation should follow that template full stop. Here's what it looks like in one of our reports. So we're in the recommendation section, sloped roof, asphalt shingles, condition, missing loose or torn, implications. By the way, the software should add, add those implications for you. Chance of water damage to contents, furnaces and or structure, sorry, finishes and or structure. Location, rear slope, task, replace, time, immediate, done. Photo with a caption. Everybody's, ha clients understand that, they get it. It's simple, no big deal. Why do implications matter so much? Well, sometimes they're self-evident, but sometimes not. When I explain to my wife, we have a cracked pane of glass in a window, she gets it. When I explain to her we have a crack in the furnace heat exchanger, no clue. A crack is a crack to her, right? So is that the same nuisance level as a window? Of course not. But if the clients don't understand why it matters, they are not likely to follow your advice. Now, I'm going to tell you, clients don't often follow our advice, no matter how clear you make it, but that's a different discussion. The reality is, if they don't get it, they are very unlikely to do anything about it. So when I tell them to change a circuit breaker because the circuit is uh, doesn't have adequate overcurrent protection or is overfused, that's very different than saying, hey, this might start a fire. Everybody understands might start a fire, okay? Not everybody understands inadequate overcurrent protection. The double talk doesn't work. Okay. I think the implications are super important. And again, I like it when the system does it for me. Okay. Enough of my philosophy. I am sure you disagreed with some of what I just said. And if you did, God love you. I understand. And uh, I'm not trying to be right here. I'm just trying to tell you where I'm coming from. So if you want to find out why I'm crazy and uh, what I do about it, let's go to the next step. So I'm going to go in two phases here. I'm going to talk about a setup process and then I'm going to talk about performance. Let's start with setup and I'm going to ask you to sharpen your tools. I am going to tell you that there's a lot of good software out there and most of it does not get used elegantly by the client. We waste a lot of what is available to us. It's kind of the way I use Word, kind of like a memory typewriter, and the way I use Excel like a calculator. Use your software like a scalpel, not a machete. Get it set up properly. Spend a few minutes, especially during these very strange times, to save literally days of work every year from now until the rest of your life. Get it set up properly. Let's look at some examples. Okay, here's a confession. Our Horizon database has, I don't know, 6,000 items in it. It has to have, because we're trying to be all things to all people. We are trying to make our software work for people in Southern California and in Massachusetts. The reality though is that Massachusetts doesn't have any evaporative coolers and Southern California doesn't have any steam boilers and they hardly ever have snow on the roof. So everything is in there. What I need you to do, what you need to do is go into your database and it's so easy with good software these days and just get rid of all, I'll never use that. I never see that. I never see wood stoves. I never see this. I never see that. Um, whatever it is, get rid of it. Declutter your life before you start. It speeds everything up. Now, the second thing is having done that, Go in and customize, make it yours. So I say beam, you say girder. Perfect, go in and change it. Make it yours. If I say lintel and you say header, or if I say toilet and you say water closet, go in and make it yours. The other thing you can do is when we give you a heading, when we can say, here's the toilet and here's the, the 10 common problems, do yourself a couple of favors. If you have additional problems you usually find that aren't on the list, add them. But also you can sort those in a way that makes sense to you. I usually use most common defects first. You can also use alphabetical order and you might have a third way of sorting them, but get them so that they fall to your fingertips quickly and easily. It's just a simple little thing to do, but boy, if we can speed up the process, that's great. I would say customize 
in, in our system, you have three different ways of describing the location. You can describe the task and you describe the time. And we make it so they're drop down lists with clicks. You can sort those, you can change them. For example, under location, you might be a north, south, east, west kind of guy or a front, left, right, rear kind of guy. Get rid of the stuff that you don't use. For tasks, if repair and replace is what you always put, put it at the top of your list. If you say remedy as needed, put it there. If you're Mike Casey and you say further review by qualified expert prior to end of inspection contingency period, type that in once, put it at the top of your list and click it and it's there for you. So sort those out the way you need them. It's just so simple, so self-evident, so easy, and yet I see so few, people, so few people do it. It's just crazy. Let me touch on templates for a second. So a template is a tool that you can build that allows you to use one click to make a whole bunch of entries. Lots of applications. Let me give you a, a simple one. So you live in a community and on the edge of town, there's a subdivision that was built with 200 houses in the 90s and they're all the same. They all have a poured concrete foundation, conventional floor joist framing. They're all wood frame brick veneer on the front vinyl siding on the other three sides. They all have roof trusses. They all have 100 amp service, copper supply wiring, ABS, plastic waste, you get the idea. You can set that up as a template called uh, Northwest uh, 90s subdivision go in, click that button once, and all those entries are done for you. You can set up as many of those as you like. Take the time, set up a few, and save yourself a bunch of time. Um, now, here's an important one. If I sold you on the summary, or if you already do it anyway, you can preset which defects automatically go to the summary, so you don't have to remember to do it. So a worn out roof, a 25 year old water heater, uh, an air conditioner that's 18 years old and making a strange noise, whatever it is that whenever you click that box and describe that issue, it should be in the summary. You can preset that. The other thing is we have 1700 illustrations for you to use. We've attached some of the illustrations to some of our defects but you don't have to buy that. You can change them. You can add other illustrations. There's a huge number to choose from. You can remove the one, oh, that's not what it looks like in my area. I'm not gonna use that illustration, good for you. And so you can set those up again one time and you're done. So we're still on the setup here thing. Now you can also preset the task and time. So if every time you see a cracked heat exchanger, you're gonna say replace the furnace. The word replace can be there automatically. And you just uh, check the heat exchanger issue. The task gets done. I would say the time for a cracked heat exchanger would be immediate. So you can preset those so you don't have to bother fussing with that. You're gonna be consistent. You're gonna do it right. You're gonna deliver clear, elegant communication to your client without you spending a bunch of time and without them wondering what you're talking about. Reverse polarity receptacle, simply always gonna tell them to repair it and it's always gonna be immediate because it's electric shock hazard, right? So simple, set it up, done. We can speed things up dramatically. Same with implications, preset them. So if it's an electrical problem, it's either gonna be an electrical shock hazard or a fire hazard probably, okay? That's gonna cover off most of the cases. Get those in there, let them live for you, let them work for you without you fussing about them each and every report. Better still, you can add a note and you can preset it to appear every time you check that box. So if you've got a downspout on old house, you can say, our city of Jupiter has a downspout disconnection grant program. Details can be found here. So if your community doesn't want you dumping your downspouts into their combination sewer system, but they want you to dump it out onto the ground, they will sometimes give you money to redirect the downspouts. You might want to tell your clients about those. Those kinds of notes, write them once, they're always in there. You never get the wording wrong. You never forget to do it, one and done. It's brilliant. Okay, how tough is this stuff to use? I mentioned speed right before. It's like a five minute learning curve if you're a really slow learner, okay? It is not complicated. And I promise you, it will save you at least 15 minutes every report, every time, 
for as long as you write reports. It gets rid of the navigation, and again, it's for descriptions and limitations. On a uh, iPhone, it looks like this. Works on an iPhone, works on an Android, works on the web version. You can do it any any environment, any device you want. And the magic is, I'm looking at gutter material here, so I'm going to click aluminum, and then I've got this set up, and you set it up once. We actually set it up for you, but you can customize it. Set it up once. Now, when I click aluminum gutters, it just automatically goes to the next screen and it asks me what kind of shingle, asphalt shingles. Click that, and it goes on. So it you don't have to navigate. You don't have to move anywhere. You just point and click, and it keeps presenting the next screen for you. If it doesn't apply, you just hit next and move on. If you want to stop and add two, because there are aluminum gutters on the front, but they're galvanized steel at the back, you can make two entries. If you make the mistake, you can go back and, and fix it. It's a piece of cake, but it takes what would normally take 20 or 30 minutes down to five minutes. It's so crazy. Okay. The other one is search. So I said SpeedWrite works for descriptions and limitations, what about recommendations? Well, navigation is the tough thing. And the more we go to phones for writing reports and small mobile devices, the less screen real estate there is. So the more navigating, scrolling, clicking, uh, going, drilling down, pulling back out, we have to do. I'm gonna say, I have a new mantra. Navigation is dead, long live search. And by that, I mean, don't be scrolling around through your software looking for the right heading or the right item. Just search it. Okay. So I can never remember fireplaces. Now, are they in the heating section or the interior section? Exhaust fans, electrical section or interior section? Maybe stuff you do every day becomes habit for you, but heat recovery ventilators, where are they? Anything in your report, and again, when you have thousands of items in your database, you can spend time looking around for what you're looking for. With search, you don't have to fuss with that. You just, if you're using a mobile device, you can either talk into it or you can type on it either way and just say what you're looking for. Clogged gutters, cracked asphalt shingle, block vinyl, or sorry, buckled vinyl siding, reverse player, whatever it is, just say it and the system takes you there. We spent some time, even if you use slightly different words like gutter, eaves trough. If you say eaves trough, it'll still take you to the right place. We've built in the words that others might use. So whatever word you use, it should take you right there. Now, if you're gonna type, it's so smart that you don't even have to type out the whole word. So you, for clog gutters, and I, I recommend using about three letters, C-L-O-G-U-T, and you're done. It takes you to that item in the report and you're done. It's brilliant. and uh, cracked asphalt shingle, just put in three letters of each of the first, and you'll either get no results or you see the result. If you get too many results, type more letters and refine it. If you don't see any results, type uh, different letters, see what you get. Buck buckled vinyl siding, you can do B-U-C-V-I-N, or you can do N-Y-L. Any letters in the word work as long as they're in the right order. So the search is super powerful. It's so much faster than navigating and scrolling. It will save you a bunch of time. So here we searched for reverse polarity up in the text box just by typing in R-E-V-P-O-L and we get the item and it's in the report, you're done. Okay, couple of sidebar comments. Let's save some time and let's improve your inspection experience, although this is not directly report writing. So I'll move quickly, but I wanted to cover off this. I want you to first of all, have your contract reviewed. If you haven't done it recently, and by recently, I mean in the last two years because the, the laws have changed. I want you to get your contract reviewed by a lawyer and preferably the lawyer who would end up defending you if you end up in court. So that might be your E&O insurance company's recommended lawyer, not sure, but get them to have a look at it. Question came up the other day in a big webinar we were doing, is an electronic signature acceptable? I'm gonna say it is in our area, I know it is in most, but please check with a lawyer in your area. Generally speaking, I'm gonna say the answer is yes, that's where, where the world has gotten to, but I'm not a lawyer and I don't wanna take the responsibility, but just check that. 
So I think it's really important to get your contract signed before the inspection. It's a liability issue. e and insurance companies don't like it if you don't get the inspection contract accepted before. Gives the client time to read, understand, think about it, ask questions. Way more powerful and effective than doing it on site at the beginning of the inspection. Additionally, it saves you time on the inspection. And most importantly, perhaps, it allows you to start the inspection with a positive messaging. You're going in, you're greeting the client, you're asking them about their plans, you're telling them what you're going to do. Way more fun than saying, now here's all the stuff we're not going to do. Take some time and read this intimidating document and sign it before we get started. That's not a great way to build a relationship in my world. So I love to get it done before. I should say, by the way, that we're somewhere over 95% of getting our contracts accepted before the inspection. Same thing with getting paid. And this one is a little stickier for a lot of inspectors. It was sticky for me too until I did it and realized, hey, clients don't know how it's supposed to be. When I order from Amazon, I pay before I get it, right? When I order a home inspection, I pay before I get it, right? That's the way the world works. Of course it is. So equally good if your software can do all this for you too, but getting paid before the inspection gets rid of all the bad checks and the credit cards that uh, didn't go through, saves you time, saves your client looking like a jerk if they make a mistake and meant to pay you but didn't do it successfully. Um, and a way better way to end the inspection. So you finish up with a summary, congratulating the clients, wishing them well in their new home, and everybody parts friends. Much better than saying, now can you dig into your wallet and give me more money? And as you know, the process of buying a house is everybody's in your pocket all the time. So if we can have that off the table and finish up with a smile and probably no longer a handshake, but uh, a pleasant wish and away you go. I think that adds to the experience. And lastly, one other thing that again, your software should do for you is allow you to have a contract first and a payment first button. That might be called something different, but I think that they all have it. So the idea is that your client can't get the report until they've accepted the contract terms and paid you. Now, to me, that should be done before the inspection ever starts, but if stuff slips through the crack, it's a nice safety net to have. Okay, now I'm gonna shift gears. We've talked about the setup and I would encourage you to take some time to get your tool as sharp as it can possibly be. Now, I'm gonna to move to the implementation part or the performance part. And I'm gonna come back to this key question. Does this help my client? If the answer is no, I'm gonna suggest you might get it the heck out of your report. And this is probably where I'm gonna to start to tick you off if I haven't already. Now, before I go into these, let me tell you a couple of things. I did not make these up, and I did not find these in one or two reports. I found them in lots of reports, and that's why they're in this presentation, because they make me insane. Okay, so in the report, this is a two-story, four-bedroom house. Well, thank goodness you shared that with your client, because I'm reasonably positive that they will not have noticed that before the inspection. They had no idea what they were buying until you so kindly pointed it out for them. Seriously? The swimming pool is located in the backyard. What swimming pool? How did they put it in the backyard? Complete nonsense. Let's get down to some technical valuable stuff. Flooring, two by eight joists, 16 inches OC. Okay, do you remember me talking about millennials at the beginning? Does a millennial know what a two by eight is? Do they know what a joist is? And does 16 inches OC mean six, oh, wait a minute. Do they know the little quotes are inches? I'm not sure. And is OC Orange County? What is it? Now, let's pretend clients are stupid and inspectors are smart. So here's my question to you as the inspector. You're reading this report and the inspector has told you they're two by eight joists, 16 inches on center. So, Mr. Inspector reading, is that floor okay? I have no freaking idea. How far is the span? What's the lumber species? Is there bridging, bracing, blocking? What's the live load? All those things are important, but they're not in here. So, the client wants to know, is the floor okay? 
and you give them information that's not even useful to other home inspectors, let alone useful to them. And if you go the next step and say two by eight joists on 16 inch center spanning nine foot six, good, one more piece of data, still not enough to know whether the floor is okay, who is this helping? Is this you doing busy work, pretending you're adding value when you're really not? Is this you wasting your time and your client's time? I submit to you, this has no place in a home inspection report. For those of you who do it, I apologize. Thermostat is on the exterior wall. So what? You and I know that's a bad location for a thermostat, but wouldn't it make more sense to make a recommendation to relocate the thermostat to an interior wall so that it will reflect the room temperature more accurately? So there was an action problem implication resolution. Brilliant. But that sentence, thermostat is on exterior wall, completely useless. Here's another one we all do. Furnace capacity, 80,000 BTU per hour. Most of us don't even bother putting whether it's input or output. What does the client want to know? Is the furnace going to keep me warm on the coldest day of the year? And you give me a number with a bunch of letters after it. How many clients know a British thermal unit? How many clients know that that's the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water one Fahrenheit degree? And why does that matter? It's ridiculous that we, and every home inspection report in the world includes this. Why? Is the furnace big enough to heat the home or not? That's what the client wants to know. Furnace blower, direct drive or belt drive, what does that mean to a client? The duct material, galvanized fiberglass. I mean, if it's disposable and collapsible and it's broken and it's bad or it's rusted, that's important. But describing the type of it just doesn't matter. Air filter type, disposable, washable, etc. It's useful in a maintenance kind of way, but is this going to help me make the most important financial decision of my life? Is this going to help me buy this house or make a decision not to buy it? I'm going to suggest to you it doesn't belong here. You're wasting your time and you're wasting your client's time. And every time you put in something like this, you also run the risk of being wrong and looking like an idiot. Less is more. Air conditioning rating three tons. Who the heck knows what a ton is? 12,000 BTUs per hour. I don't know what that means. Water heater, everybody gives the BTU rating and the size. It's important to tell them it's 40 gallons. Is that enough for my family? I've got seven kids, probably not. But without that knowledge, your report doesn't mean a darn thing. Water, induced draft water heater or fan assist water heater. So what? Is the water heater working? Is it gonna give me enough hot water? That's all I care about. Overflow noted on kitchen sink. Sounds like a good thing, right? To a homeowner? Oh, it's got an overflow. Well, you and I know you're not supposed to have an overflow on a kitchen sink, but unless you tell the client the problem, why it matters and what to do about it, we haven't done our jobs, not in my opinion. Okay, stairwell lighting controlled by three-way switches. Firstly, let's understand, electricians come up with phrases like three-way switches so they can charge a lot of money and make sure nobody understands what the heck they do. Makes absolutely no sense to me, three-way switches. If you're telling the client that um, I can't turn on the light at the top of the stairs, so I have to go down the stairs in the dark, that's a problem. Most clients would understand that. But this means absolutely nothing. And by the way, as a sidebar, this is some of the useless information that we put in trying to be helpful, even though there's no recommendation that follows this or involved here, you're just telling them something that they don't understand. And if it's not broken, shut up about it. Don't put it in your report. Your report is to include recommendations for condition, conditions to be improved. It is not to be a checklist of all the stuff that's fine. I'll get onto that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself because I get passionate about this. Ground fault circuit interrupters protect exterior receptacles. From what, raccoons? Do you think a millennial knows what a ground fault circuit interrupter is or what it does? And why does it protect exterior receptacles? GFCI in bathroom and on exterior. Well, if they didn't understand ground fault circuit interrupters, they're certainly not gonna understand GFCI. And what does it mean that it's in a bathroom and on the exterior? Gosh, if there's water there, should it be in the kitchen too? Oh yeah, probably. Again, you get the nonsense that we put in our reports. The service entrance is overhead. I touched on this when we talked about the standards. What does that mean to my client? 
nothing. Utilities were on at the time of the inspection. Great, shut up about it. But wait a minute, if the utilities were off, now I have a limitation. But what did I say about limitations? Don't just describe it as a limitation. You need to make this recommendation. Get the electricity turned on and have the electrical system inspected. You can have an electrician do that or we can do that for an additional fee up to you, or we can come back and do that at your convenience. It's all part of our amazing service. Whatever you want to do, but don't just say the power was off and move on. What else? Doorbell, seriously. And I understand there is at least one state in the union where the standards say you have to inspect doorbells. It's really critical because can you imagine the poor family that had searched and searched for the right house and they finally found one that fits their needs, it's in the right school district, it's in their price range, it's in a condition that's not great, but they can afford to move into it, get their family settled in. But wait a minute, you've pointed out the doorbell doesn't work. So now they have to change their mind about buying the house. Now they go away and look again for a new house with the doorbell that works. Does this really matter? Is this part of what we're here to do? When I started doing home inspections, and I still believe this to be true, our role is to help people make an important decision. We are not inventory takers, and we are not handymen, checklist, maintenance guys. This is not what we do, nor should it be. And when it creeps into the standards, it makes my skin crawl. Telling people the type of the roof, gable, shed, flat, doesn't mean anything to them, doesn't help them at all. Now, if it's a butterfly-shaped roof, you might point out that everything converges to one low spot and you're likely to have chronic leakage there. Okay, that's meaningful. Telling them about the flashing material, complete waste of time. And you might get it wrong anyway because it's not actually aluminum, it's galvalume, whatever. Deck joist hanger type, metal. What? Why does a deck joist need to be hung anyway? Clients don't understand what we're talking about, the jargon, the useless information in our reports. And if you think I'm making this stuff up, go look at one of yours. Okay, uh, this is one of my favorites. Now we're gonna get into a fight, I'm pretty sure. How many of you report the weather conditions in your reports? Okay, probably more than one. So. Things like, we have a section called Site Info. We put it in Horizon because people want it. We don't use it at Carson Dunlop, but all of our clients do. And you report the weather, whether it was sunny or rainy, the time the inspection started and ended, who attended, what time did they arrive and leave, was the house occupied, how old was the house, how big was the house, how many bedrooms, all that stuff. Forget it, get rid of it, doesn't matter. That's all for your benefit. How does that help your client? How does that help your client? It's all cover your butt stuff. If you need to record it, record it in the work order somewhere. Don't subject your client to having read a page that doesn't give them any value. It's a waste of their time. Okay, but I know you're all thinking, but the weather's important. It's gonna keep me out of jail. Well, I can tell you what, after several hundred thousand inspections, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times the weather was actually a determining factor in a complaint. More importantly, far more importantly, here's a website that if you go to, it will give you the weather, not for just the day of the inspection, but all the days before and after that for as far as you wanna go in excruciating detail for every place in America for free. In a way that's far more credible than your half-baked report. So the client's complaining about your report and saying you screwed up something about the roofing, but now they're gonna believe that you got the weather right. Why would they even accept your word about the weather when they're challenging your word on the condition of the roof? Shut up about the weather, leave it alone. Now, again, I'm gonna say that I understand there are a couple of states that say you have to include the weather in their state legislation for home inspection. God love them. Uh, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. It's a waste of time, folks, sorry. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop now. 
Uh, I've beat you up a little bit, but you get the idea. And again, I see it in reports. Everybody does it. It's that standard of care. We all do the same thing, but nobody's stopping and saying, why? Why are we doing this? Okay, a little bit of homework for you. Pull out your last three reports and look at every word and answer this question. Does this word help my client? See if there's anything in that report you can remove. Okay, um, report rating best practices. Let's look at a few and I'm gonna cover some ground again because I wanna uh, reinforce some points, so bear with me. Um, I'm gonna move probably fairly quickly through this, but I wanna make sure that we orient our thinking and we're kind of all on the same page. So we've said descriptions are a necessary evil, largely inflicted on us by the standards. Limitations should not include what's in your standards of practice, but should be site specific and should be followed up with a recommendation. And your recommendations or observations and recommendation section is the heart and soul of why we exist. So pretty simple concept. Those to me are the three elements of a report. So descriptions, standards, be simple and generic. I am aware of lawsuits in the first two cases I've listed here. Um, and I've got another one. Um, don't describe it as a cedar roof, even though most wood roofs are cedar. Describe it as a wood roof because a pressure treated pine roof is not cedar. Describe it as plastic piping, not CPVC or polybutylene piping, because eventually you're going to be wrong about that. Asphalt shingle is absolutely fine, or comp shingle, if that's what you say, but please don't describe it as a 30 year shingle or architectural or laminated. First of all, if you tell somebody it's a 30 year shingle, they're going to think it lasts 30 years. Okay. Less is more on the descriptions. Um, the other one I'm thinking of is a guy described uh, an older, beautiful house as having a slate roof. Turns out it was fiber cement. What do you think it costs to add a slate roof to a house these days? So you put the client in the position that you told them he was in when you wrote the report. That was a significant problem. Be generic. Okay, structure. Uh, here's what I think. Keep it absolutely simple to meet the standards. Configuration, basement, foundation, material, poured concrete, floor construction, joists, exterior wall construction, wood frame, brick veneer, roof and ceiling framing, trusses. It's either trusses or rafters, generally speaking, right? So that's all you need. You don't need sentences. You don't need narrative. That's it. You're done. Let's look at the plumbing system, a little more to it. Service piping into the building, copper. Supply piping in the building, copper. Main water shutoff at the front of the basement. Here's an interesting one. The standards ask you to do this. The main water shutoff valve, um, picture your client moves into the house. Two years after they move in, there's a horrible flood. Something has burst somewhere in the house. They're looking around for how to shut off the water. Somebody says, wait a minute, we had a home inspection. Wait a minute. In the report, they told us where the main shutoff valve was. Where's that report? Let's go fire up the computer. Let's go look for the report. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I found it. Maybe I didn't. I wonder if it's in here. Oh, yeah, let's scroll through. Like, like seriously, that's never going to happen in a million years. Why are we telling the client where the water shutoff valve is? I don't know. But we all do it, or at least most of us do it. If you want to put a big tag on it, a big bright yellow tag that says, turn the water off here, that might be more valuable for your client. Burying it in the description section of a report they're never going to find or look at again makes absolutely no sense to me. What else? We've got to put the water heater type conventional. This is all just to meet the standards. Water heater type conventional. The fuel is gas. Um, the capacity is 40 gallons. They don't care about any of that. Age four years, typical life expectancy eight to 12. Now there's a, a granule of uh, information in here that's important. By the way, we don't talk about failure probability or estimated life remaining. For stuff that wears out, we do this. We say, here's how old it is, and here's a typical life expectancy. You do the math. And if it's close to the end, 
we'll make a recommendation to replace it when necessary. So if the water heater is nine years old, we would say approximate age nine years, typical life expectancy eight to 12 years, that's the description section done. In the recommendation section, we say water heater, replace when necessary, nine years old, typical life, eight to 12, be ready, okay? Waste and vent piping and building plastic. So this description stuff, keep it short and sweet. Limitations we've talked about. Um, don't reiterate the standards. I've said that a bunch of times now, not enough. We've talked about all this. I don't need to go through this again. We've hammered that. Okay, there it is just in writing. So the water supply was turned off. So the plumbing system could not be tested. Can't stop there. The water should be turned on and inspected by a qualified specialist. We are available to inspect the plumbing system once it has been turned on. Key point here is we're not turning on the water, folks. We don't know why it was turned off. Please do not ever turn on the water in a house. If it's been winterized, you just flushed all the antifreeze out of the uh, fixtures and you're not gonna be very popular. If it was shut off because there was a leak, you might've just caused a flood in a bedroom upstairs or bathroom upstairs and all through the house, okay? So pretty obvious stuff. Okay, let's move on to the meat and potatoes, the observation and recommendations. We talked about component condition, implication, location, task, time. By the way, I'm leaving cost out of here. We're one of the few maniacs in North America that actually gives our client ballpark costs of repair. We won't have that discussion today because there'll be blood on the floor and I'll lose. Um, what I do want you to be is elegantly simple and clear and consistent. Do it the same way for every defect every time and declutter absolutely everything. Okay. So here I've got, well, that's an interesting chimney flashing. Um, so down the left is my list, component condition, implication, location, task time, and pictures. In this case, we've got both an illustration and a photo. I always like that because people can see sort of the theory of it and then see the real life practice. So uh, slope roof flashing, chimney flashings, missing, et cetera. You can read it, it's just a few words, just a few words but the story is told, the client gets it. Okay, what's gonna happen? Well, I'm gonna have water damage if I don't fix this. When should I fix it? Immediately. We don't write specifications. We don't tell them how to do it. We don't tell them to let those counter flashings into the mortar joints and add a reglet. Not a chance. Keep it simple, keep it brief. Okay. Clutter, we talked about this a little bit already. Maintenance tips, get them the heck out of your reports. An appendix is a good spot for them and label them as maintenance tips that apply to every home or important advice for all homeowners or helpful advice for helping you take care of your home or something like that. So the client understands what's in that section instead of burying it in with all the really important stuff. Okay, I want you to use a summary. I talked about it at the outset. For some of you, you're gonna tell me, no, it's too risky. I know it's scary. I'm just gonna tell you to get over it. And by the way, don't bury it at the back, put it at the front. The client should be able to find it. If you're worried about your liability, borrow this phrase. This summary is provided as a courtesy and is not a substitute for the entire report. The complete report must be read and considered before making decisions related to the home inspection. I'd love to take credit for those sentences, but that's a lawyer doing that, okay? So do we have a problem with this? No, we don't. Okay, what else we got here? I'm gonna tell you, this is a funny one. I'm gonna tell you every time you have a client, you really have three different clients. And I've kind of alluded to this a little bit before. I'm gonna tell you your first client is someone who's trying to decide whether to buy a house or not. That's the client who wants the thumbs up or thumbs down and for whom a summary is plenty. 90 days later, that client morphs into a brand new homeowner who's moved into their new home, wondering what they've gotten themselves into and what they're gonna do now. That's the body of your report. Here's the stuff you've got to fix. Here's when you've got to do it. Here's why it matters. Super valuable. 
your third client is the one who's been living in the house for a while and now has a problem or they've got a worn out roof and they're trying to decide, are we going to go asphalt shingles? Or are we going to go wood roof? Or are we going to do something different? What's the difference between a mid efficiency and a high efficiency furnace? Those are the clients that want chapter and verse. That's why our reports are written in three layers. That third layer is the links to the additional reference material for people who want to roll up their sleeves and understand what a valley flashing really is. In a lot of software these days, including ours, you can include reference material. Included with ours is a 480 page book with about 550 color illustrations that's called the Home Reference Book. It's free for all your clients. There's an ebook built right into the report. It's a terrific resource for them. It includes a bunch of stuff on life cycles and costs that can help them make all kinds of important decisions. It includes all kinds of home setup tips and home maintenance tips. It builds out a, a seasonal program for them and it explains how their house works. It's great. So it's easy to do these days understand you've probably got three different clients when you're communicating make sure you're mindful of what state your client is in and which mindset of a client they are okay communication style you've heard me talk about bullet points um i'm not a checklist guy i'm not a tables guy I don't like all the symbols and icons. I don't like the IN for inspected, NI for not inspected, NP for not present, D for defective. It's alphabet soup. Do clients really understand that? And given today's technology, we surely don't need to be giving stuff that people have to go refer somewhere else to read. Technology just makes it so easy to communicate so much more clearly. And lastly, I have never had a client tell me they would have rather had a 30 page narrative report, single space, double sided, half inch margins on the outside. Thank you very much. People hate reading these days. People can't watch a video through these days. People are scrolling through videos, trying to get through a two minute video faster. Do you think anybody wants to read narrative? Absolutely not. Keep it to an absolute minimum. Okay touched on these things. Uh, the other point in here is I really hate these inspections and I understand some are mandated and some of them are state required, doesn't stop me from hating them. When I have to go through every component in the house and every component in the report and check a stupid box that says inspected or not inspected or not present. If I have to check something for everything in the house, who is that helping? How does that help my client? Is that the state trying to make sure that I remembered to check that? Is the state naive enough to think that if I forgot, I'm not just going to check the box anyway? It's useless, totally useless. Or maybe it's just me. Anyway, I should move on before I get into even more trouble. Okay. Um, I've touched on this a little bit. I hate the symbols and the icons. I hate the cute little things that my brain has to stop and think, what is he trying to tell me here? I don't like codes. I don't like a legend. I don't like glossaries. It's 2020, folks. If you have to explain what something is, and God knows I'll get to a point where I'll show you that you should, don't make them turn to page 37 to find out what it means. Tell them right there where they're looking what it means. Glossaries are obsolete, waste of time. It's just like navigation is dead, long live search. Glossaries are dead. Explain the word where you find the word. Okay, photos and illustrations, we talked about how great they are, but don't overdo it. Less is more with these guys too. I'm gonna, people always ask me, how many in a report? I'm gonna say, I don't know, depends on the house. Let's say 15 to 50, but, but if your software is any good, you can take a bunch more to cover your butt, but don't put them in the report. I love systems that do that because I don't have to do any work. I take the photo, it's there, but I don't have to do anything with it. Except if I get a call six months later, I can say, hey, here's this photo. Remember what it looked like when we were there? Okay, but don't provide all your defensive photos in the report because when your client's trying to buy the house or make a decision or maintain it, he doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about your liability. That's not a problem for him. 
don't make him look at stuff he doesn't need. Okay, let's cover it in a home inspection. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move on. Let's get rid of this. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to this guy. I love how every picture tells a story this way. How could you write that up in a meaningful way? You couldn't. That's just, it speaks for itself. You don't need to be sophisticated to identify that that's a problem. How clear is it in this illustration why the downspout should be extended? It is so simple and so visual. It's powerful communication. Use it. With our software, it's included free and we even put it in the right spot for you. It's hard not, you actually have to go out of your way not to use it. It's just so helpful. Here's one of those photos that you should take by all means, but don't put it in the report. Keep it in your file. And again, good software automatically files it for you. So the garage was filled with clutter. Hey, that happens. People are getting ready to move. Their real estate agent said, get all the clutter out of your house. So they do, they stuff it all in the garage. You can't inspect the garage very well. So that's a limitation. By the way, should be followed with a recommendation. The garage should be emptied and inspected. We're happy to come back and do that for you. But that photo doesn't need to be in the report because that doesn't help the client at all. If you get a call in nine months and the client says, hey, there's a three quarter inch wide crack on the garage floor that you didn't tell me about, then you can send them this picture and say, remember what it looked like in the garage? Remember we said that we couldn't do this? Remember we told you that we should get the garage emptied so we could inspect the garage properly? That's the conversation you wanna have. Okay, so what photos? Front of the house? Um, yeah, I want a title page photo in my report anyway. Uh, some people say all four sides. I'm not so fussed about that. I would say roof, attic, and crawl space. The places the clients never go, A, to prove that you were there or at least looked at it with a drone or a, a, an eye stick device or something like that, but it's useful reference information. And then photos of most recommendations. There are some that I might not bother with, uh, a photo of a reverse polarity, for example, things that are missing. Um, so if there's no roof vents, I don't need additional pictures of the uh, the roof showing no vents. You can do that if you want. Most inspectors do, to be honest with you. But think about adding photos the same way as we've talked about everything else. Do they add value? How does this help my client? So most of the time, so that's gonna be kind of it. There are a bunch of other photos most people put in, including that where to shut off the, uh, the water. Um, again, not sure it's ever gonna be useful to your client, but it's gonna be hard for me to get you to stop doing it. I understand that. Okay, do the description sections need photos? I'm gonna say for the most part, no. You might want the odd shot. We talked about a glamour shot of uh, maybe the roof, the crawl space, the attic, uh, and so on to prove that you were there. Limitation photos, keep them in your file. They don't help the client. Okay, let's move on. We talked about this at the outset and I glossed over a point that I just wanted to come back to. When we talk about stuff that wears out, so roofs, furnaces, air conditioners, water heaters, that kind of stuff, describe it give the age and give the typical life. And I don't care what your typical life is. If you disagree with me on high efficiency furnace is good for you, make it different, I don't care. Um, but I would stay away from words like failure probability and remaining life. To me, those are liability inviters. If you're wrong about those, I think you're in trouble. So don't promise somebody he's got this much remaining life in his roof. You can give them the age and give them a typical life because things sometimes go beyond or don't last as long as typical. So you're not making a definitive statement that's gonna come back and bite you. Okay, and as I said earlier, if the furnace were 15 years old and your life expectancy is 15 to 20 years, you put this in the description, but then you make a recommendation to change out the furnace when it fails. Okay, here's a phrase that I love, possible concealed damage. I think it's your best friend. There are so many things that we look at where we can't see what's going on behind. So a uh, bad grout in a shower stall, good example. Is it a grout repair or is there structural damage to the, uh, the whole enclosure? 
saying something like the grout in the shower is cracked is fine, but I might add the second bet. There may be concealed damage to the structure behind. Remember when I said at the outset about setting up and sharpening your tools? Perfect example of a note you may want to add once in the grout is cracked section of your report, allowing for the possibility of concealed damage. For those of us who live in the north, ice damming is another classic example of a situation where there might be possible concealed damage. There are all kinds of them. So don't forget about it. It's your friend. Use it and use the tool to build it in once and forget about it. Okay. The code, we don't really have to talk about the code issues, do we? Please tell me you don't use code references in your reports. By the way, words like current building practice are fine if you want to compare this crappy old house to what's done today. Um, however, let me give you the, the counterpoint to that. I don't want you referencing codes, but I want your report advice and content to be consistent with the codes. Unless you choose to disagree, and believe me, I disagree with the codes fairly regularly, but I'm going out on a limb when I do so because I know that the contractor who comes behind or the municipal inspector who comes behind is going to disagree with me. So if I'm going to deviate from the codes, I'm going to explain why I'm deviating in the report. Okay, so as a general rule, refer to it as current building practice if you want to compare what was to what would be today. And then secondly, Make sure that your information is consistent unless you are specifically disagreeing, okay? Uh, there, are, there isn't one code. Homeowners don't understand that. It's not one code book, and it wasn't written in 1900 and never changed. There are several codes that apply, and they change every three years. How could any human being possibly know them all? They can't. It's a physical impossibility. A code compliance inspection is completely different than a home inspection. We're doing a performance inspection. We are not doing a compliance inspection. Significant difference, okay? We need our skill set and focus to say, is this home going to keep me warm, safe, and dry? Not a lot to do with the code. Is this house going to perform its intended function and keep me warm, safe, and dry? Okay, here's a good example. The balcony guardrail openings violate the building code. What? Or you might say the large openings between railing spindles may allow a child to fall through. Reduce the opening width to no more than four inches to improve safety. So we've got the condition, we've got the implications, we've got the recommendation, that's part of the story. But it's understandable to the client. The code thing, nobody's gonna do anything, so it violates the code, I hope I don't get caught. This isn't about getting caught violating the code, folks. It's about keeping your family safe. That's the message we fail to get through when we talk about code. Jargon, I'm gonna say it's our job to write to communicate, not to intimidate. James and I were talking before the session. He made such a great point. You are the expert by definition. You don't have to prove it. They hired a professional home inspector. Box checked, move on. You don't need to prove your worth with every sentence you write. You need to take care of your client with every sentence you write. Explain all these terms because the millennials won't understand them. Reverse polarity, double tapping, GFCI, AFCI, conductor, bonding, backdrafting, heat exchanger, limit switch, chest trap, truss, swale, purlin, lintel, girt, TPR. Oh, is that a temperature pressure relief valve? What does it do? I don't know. Induced draft, all that stuff. Go through your reports and see if you can find one technical term that you don't explain to your client. If you don't have any of those in your report, pour yourself a rewarding beverage of your choice. Vulnerable conditions, another friend of yours, by the way, that not many of us make their acquaintance as frequently as they should. When something ain't broke, but it's about to break, the leaning chimney, the bad grading, I didn't see any basement leakage, but man, this grading sucks. The missing safety device, 
hey, it doesn't cause a problem yet, but it's likely to. Vulnerable conditions should be written up. A valley on a roof with a chimney stuck right at the bottom of the valley, that's a vulnerable condition. Skylights that infringe on multiple roof lines, vulnerable conditions. When you see one, describe it as such, give the client a heads up and say, this is likely to be a problem. Save yourself the phone call, the grief, the fury down the road. It's not worth it. Okay, report writing practices. So we've been talking about some best. Now I'm gonna show you what I think are some of the worst. And I actually have touched on some of the worst. And let me preface this by saying, very few home inspectors are professional technical writers. Very few of us have that training and education. I have a son who's a journalist who looks at me like I am barely worthy of walking on the planet when I try and write a paragraph because he knows how to do it. It's not what we do well, let's do less of it. And to the extent we have to do it, I have a magic word that everybody is gonna hate me for saying, proofread. You all proofread your reports, right? Every time, completely? Sure you do. Okay, here's a good uh, example. Is this useful to the client? Remember the key question I keep, in, keep coming back to, how does this help my client? The roofing material was observed to have impact damage. The damage may have been caused by a hailstorm and should be further evaluated. Okay. It either had damage or it didn't. The was observed to is a complete waste of my time and my client's time. May have been caused by a hailstorm. Do the standards ask you to report on cause? Absolutely not. And as soon as you speculate about cause, which by the way, you can't prove, you're probably gonna be wrong. Another thing, oh no, I'll leave that one. I, that, I, another tangent I was gonna go on, but I'll spare you that one. Um, and should be further evaluated. Absolutely, so the roof has been damaged. So it's got hail marks all over it. The shingles are shot. Further evaluation by who, for what? If the roof is worn out, I have a suggestion, tell them to replace the roof. Further evaluation is so overused. Now, I'm gonna to defer to some people who will disagree, and I appreciate that there are times it makes great sense, and there are environments and markets where it might be more necessary. Generally speaking though, I would like you to give the client clear direction wherever possible. Okay, well, let's see what else we've got here. So three things I don't like about this sentence. Some of the exterior plugs should be upgraded to have ground fault protection, which was mandated at the time of construction. Okay, first of all, the plug is what's at the end of the cord that you put into the receptacle. You can call them an outlet or you can call them a receptacle, but you can't call them plugs. That's not what they are. It's in the search thing when we talk about, so if you get, if, if we say receptacles in Horizon and you type in outlets, we'll take you there. But if you say plugs, we're not taking you there because that's not what they are. Ground fault interruption. What does it say? Ground fault protection. Um, clients don't know what that is. And mandated at the time of construction, mandated, are they trying to avoid using the code word? And at the time of construction, does anybody know off the top of their head all the times the different GFI rules came into play? Why does that matter? If you're telling somebody to add a ground fault circuit interrupter to an exterior plug to avoid them being electrocuted when they're standing outside in the damp grass and plug in a faulty uh, lawnmower cord, that's one thing. To tell them they have to do it because it was mandated at time of construction, clients don't understand, don't respond, don't get, don't care. Okay, here's a fabulous picture of, what have we got? We're in the attic, we're looking down. I can see some ceiling joists. I can see some lath and plaster. I don't see any insulation though. I see a knob and tube wire running across uh, above the uh, ceiling joists. So in this report, 
we have said, okay, the insulation amount is inadequate. I get or is inadequate. I wouldn't disagree with that. And then the note says, no insulation in the attic. Plaster and lath ceiling are visible. Typical insulation levels are 40. I recommend a six mil polyethylene vapor barrier or vapor retarder if you prefer and fiberglass insulation valued at R40. This should be done immediately throughout the attic. Knob and tube wiring was also noted in the attic. Implications, increased heating and cooling costs. Location, attic. Task, replace the knob and tube wiring with modern cable, provide vapor barrier and insulation. Time frame immediate. I have a bunch of problems with this. Too much information in lots of different ways. Writing a specification, six mil polyethylene vapor barrier, who cares? The knob and tube wiring is an electrical problem and deserves discussion in the electrical section, not in the insulation section. Also, if you're gonna be verbose in your notes and describe the location as the attic, leave it out down below instead of putting location attic. Same thing, if you've already told them what to do, leave the task out. I'm gonna tell you it's harder for a client to read it in that big long note above, but if you put it in the note above, don't reiterate it in the data that your software asks you to put in. If you just put in nothing for task, the task won't show up, the heading won't show up, everybody will be happy. But they already told them to do it immediately up in the body of the report, and then, or sorry, in the body of the note, and then they put it in the time below. I see so much duplication and redundancy in reports. It's crazy. So there's all the stuff that I could remove from that to end up with something that looks like this. Now, amount of insulation inadequate is one thing. This one, it's unusual to have no insulation. So I think it's fair to say there's absolutely no insulation in the attic. And now providing the insulation uh, and vapor barriers a task. They decided to put the R40 up in the notes, which is fine. They could also stay under task, provide R40 valued insulation and vapor barrier. But I would not tell them to put in fiberglass or mineral wool or whatever your flavor of the month is, sprayed foam, whatever. I would leave that to the installer and the homeowner. Okay, so complex made simple. Speaking of con complex made simple, here we are talking about the wall flashings and caulkings. The goal in every case is to keep water out and lower maintenance costs. Keep in mind the success of any joinery is often inversely proportional to the complexity of the detail in the amount of caulking used. What? Trust me, I did not make this up. I couldn't make that up, okay? That is probably technically correct, but absolutely useless. At least the inspector took the time to proofread it. He probably got the grammar right. Do you write stuff like this? And tell me what I'm saying by the time I get to the end of the sentence in plain English. A feathered vertebrate enclosed in the grasping appendage that has a valuation that is superior to a couple encapsulated in a branch shrub. Or put into plain English, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Again, I put this in because we are very much in love with our technical jargon. We put stuff in that we think makes us look smart and all it does is irritates our clients and confuses them. Let me give you some more specific words to avoid and keep out of your reports. Part of your homework might be to look for these words. Problem, deficiencies, defects, adverse conditions, issues and concerns, all negative connotations designed to scare off the already jittery the already jittery first time buyer. Better to use words like observations, recommendations, conditions, findings. A, it makes you sound more like the consultant that you are, and B, it doesn't scare the heck out of people. By the way, in my opinion, home inspectors are not in the problems business, although we think of finding problems. I suggest that we are in the solutions business. We are helping people put themselves in a position where their house will keep them warm, safe, and dry. Okay, other words to avoid. This is the liability slippery slope. Satisfactory, acceptable, serviceable, structurally sound, functioning as intended, functioning as designed. Let me respectfully submit, we don't know whether it's functioning as intended. The furnace comes on when you turn the thermostat up, great. 
Does it keep you warm on the coldest day of the year? I have no freaking idea. I turn the shower on and it seems to work just fine. Does it spray water everywhere and cause a flood when a person is standing in the shower? I know very few home inspectors who stand in the shower to test it. I know of a lot of roofs that have absolutely no leakage problems when it hasn't rained for two weeks. You should not be saying any of these words. If you need to say something about stuff that seems okay, don't go any further than no issues noted. Okay. There's another part of that sentence I'm going to leave out because we'll pick that up in another slide. This is so much fun. Here we go. No defects noted at the time of the inspection. First of all, go through your reports and see if you say at the time of the inspection and then tell me what other time you think the client might have been thinking you were talking about. What other time could you be talking about? Of course you're talking about at the time of the inspection. You were only there for the inspection. This phrase doesn't make any sense. It doesn't add any value. It wastes your client's time. Not a huge deal, not a big offense, but if we're eliminating clutter, we may as well eliminate as much as we can. Okay, two comments here. First of all, don't make it personal. But secondly, I'd rather it not be opinion. I'd rather it be fact. I'd rather what you put in your reports be defendable and authoritative. And you can go back and point to the source where you got that information from. So I don't like words like amateurish, sloppy, and homeowner repair. They're personal, they're a bit insulting. By the way, do sellers ever read your reports? In my world, yeah, they do. So if I'm gonna tell the seller that he's a sloppy amateur, I've just offended him. Did I mean to, did I want to? Probably not. What I would prefer is if something's broke, describe it. Is it loose, uneven, poorly secured, inoperative, out of plumb, whatever. Those are real measurable words. You can prove that it was out of plumb with a plumb level. You can say it's poorly secured because there's one screw holding the door hinge in place and the hinge is pulling away. Whatever it is, just the facts, ma'am, would be fine, okay? Ah, yes. Words that add nothing. There's another variation to at the time of the inspection at this time. Here's another one. Visible evidence of rodent activity was observed in the attic area. Well, first of all, if it's evidence, by definition, it's visible. You don't need the word visible. And then secondly, the attic is the attic. What do you mean the attic area? Innocent little things that, remember when I said earlier, the more we write, the more we screw it up because we're not trained technical writers. This is all stuff that is noise, that this, interferes with you communicating to your client. I'm just asking you to cut down on the noise a little bit. The pier and beam foundation appear to have deficiencies that are beyond normal. Well, it's really terrifying when the beams have paranormal deficiencies because that's really spooky. What does this mean? The pier and beam foundation, are they broke? Do they need to be fixed? Are they sagging? Are they rotting? Are they not well secured to each other? What's the issue? I want you to go component, condition, implications, location, task, time. Please, please. I love this one. There are water leaks in the crawl space that need to be corrected. There are severely, sorry, there are severely damaged joists in the Northwest crawl space. So I need to correct the water leaks, but apparently I don't need to do anything about the severely damaged joists. And the water leaks are just in the crawl space in general, but the damage joists are in the northwest part of the crawl space. Do you see the inconsistencies in there? This is what gets home inspectors into trouble. What do you think a defense attorney is going to do with that sentence? You are in trouble. Okay. I'm getting close to the end here, much to your relief, I'm sure. So uh, hopefully we're going to have a few questions, but uh, let me make a couple more points and just see if I can aggravate uh, the remaining few. 
Okay, I touched on this at the outset, but people ask me all the time, how long should it take to write a report on an average house? And I'm gonna come back to less is more. I'm gonna assume that you've got your tool sharpened and I'm gonna assume that you perform efficiently and effectively. And I'm gonna say, all of these are possibilities, but what I would really suggest, I'm thinking about an hour. Less on a clean house, more on a complex house, but I would say an hour. And I'm including proofreading, and I'm including getting the illustrations right, and getting it published, and getting it sent to your client, okay? I'm not include writing out the work order. And by the way, I'm also including the time spent on site and the time spent after. So a lot of folks are collecting most of their data on site now and writing most of the report on site, which is fine. It makes for shorter report writing time after, which is all good. And I know a lot of the people who don't invite their client to come to the inspection or don't invite them to come until the end, collect a lot of their data and write a lot of the report as they're inspecting. And I say that's fine too. I'm gonna tell you something that you probably are not gonna like. I think the right way to inspect is a process that goes like this. Go through the whole house, in whatever routine you do, we start roof exterior and then bottom to top inside and then another pass through in the opposite direction, but I don't care how you do it. Um, I want you to think about doing it this way. Don't take notes, go through, use the software and, and we use our phone as a camera and as our report writing tool. So when I see a problem or a condition, I'm not saying description or limitation now, I'm saying here's a condition that I observe. I'm gonna take a photo of it and I'm gonna use search to find the item and I'm gonna click the item and that's gonna be it. And I'm assuming I've got a client with me. If I don't have a client, I might put some more data in, but that doesn't really matter. So what I do is when I find the defects, I take a photo of it and then click the item so it's in the report. That does a couple of things for me. That puts the photo in the report in the right spot so I don't have to later upload my photos or take them off my camera, put them into my computer, from my computer into my report, and then have to sort through 50 photos to figure out where each one goes. So that part saves a ton of time in report writing. It also gives you the item in there. You can put location, task, time, and all that stuff in later, but you've got that in as a placeholder you can't possibly forget. So now go through the house and every time you find something you want to make a recommendation about, you do that. You do not record your descriptions, do not record your limitations, you do not take any notes. What I'm going to suggest now is you get to the end, take a deep breath and go to SpeedWrite or whatever your software's equivalent is and enter all your recommendations, or sorry, enter all your descriptions and limitations. And I am going to tell you, I'm gonna promise you, and you won't believe me probably, that as you've gone through the house looking for defects, you have observed all the things that you need to to complete your descriptions and limitations. You can try it, and if it doesn't work for you, you can always go back. So there I am standing in the house somewhere, filling these out. Oh gosh, I forgot to check the size of the water heater go back and check it. And I promise you, if you go back and check it once, you'll never forget to mentally make a note of the size of the water heater. People say, I can't remember all this. You don't have to remember it. Your brain is an amazing tool. It takes a picture of it that you don't have to retain until the software pulls it out of your head again and says, okay, what was the supply piping? What was the waste piping? Where was the main water shutoff? Don't write this crap down as you go. You'll waste a ton of time. And if you don't trust me, that's fine. Try it a few times and you'll be amazed at how much, you might not be 100% the first few times, but I bet you'll be way closer than most people would guess. It saves so much time. And that speed right tool, it just goes boom, 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 moves you through, moves you through. You've got it all. You're, you've done your quality assurance. You made sure you didn't miss anything. You spent a fraction of the time doing it and you didn't waste time writing down stuff. So your flow goes like this collect your defects with a photo and a report entry using search. At the end, do your recommendations, or sorry, do your descriptions and limitations, at least I'm consistently idiotic, do your descriptions and limitations at the end that way. It's crazy, I know, but try it, it'll be fun. Okay, I promise you that 
if you listen to any of this, your reports are going to be better. And magically, you spend less time to create a report that is way more helpful to your clients. I think that's powerful. I really do. So you're not the only winner. Your clients love it. I'll tell you what, real estate agents kind of like clear and simple too. We get tons of comments. If you think we don't, go look at our website, carsondunlop.com. We've got over 1,400 testimonials from real estate agents and over 4,500 client testimonials on our website. And a lot of them talk about the simplicity and clarity of the report. This is a win for you all the way around. More really is less. Now, I did a presentation a month or so ago and some of my well-respected colleagues who have been around for 30 years and have done it six ways from Sunday, almost have as much gray hair as I do. They say, no, 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 more is more. And you know what? I'll buy that. More is more if every ounce of the more is helpful to your client. More is definitely not more if the more is all filler and fluff and cover your butt and useless information where you're trying to be helpful, but really just confusing the client. More is more if you're experienced, powerful, a great communicator and have a lot of knowledge. But understand, even if more is more, the vast majority of your clients aren't gonna read it, aren't gonna understand it, and saddest of all, they are not gonna act on it. Simple, clear, less is more. That's what I believe. Okay, so here's a nice way to finish off. Once your reports are really good and really clean, make them a marketing tool. Be proud of them. Use them to differentiate yourself. I laugh. Um, I think you should have a good sample report on your website, maybe more. Go around and look at some of your competitors' websites. Go and look at some of the sample reports. A lot of the comments that I've referred to today are in people's sample reports on their website where they're trying to promote their service. They don't get it. The report on the website should be clear to the client, not to your competitor. Don't worry about Mike Smith's home inspections across town tearing your report apart because it isn't technical enough. You don't want it to be technical. You're not trying to show off. You're not trying to prove anything to anybody. You're trying to help your client. That's the win. And guess what? Who's your market? Clients, maybe agents. Guess what? They both love that. They both love clear and simple. It's so freaking easy. Okay, put them on your website. Um, take them to real estate offices, share them around. When a client, when a prospect is calling and they're shopping around, say, absolutely, you should shop around. You find the right home inspector for you. Here's a good tool. Have a look at everybody's sample report and you choose to work with the company that provides the report that you can understand. What a great marketing soundbite. Check out all the reports. See what one makes sense to you. It works, folks. Trust me. Okay, that's not a marketing presentation. What am I doing? Okay, give clients what helps them, less is more, set it all, sharpen your tool and then use it like a scalpel. That's how simple it is. And what I've talked about today, under these crazy COVID times, there is no better time than when things are slow to really get it right. Take the time to set it up and again, spend 10 bucks worth of your time to save a thousand bucks. It's just a great investment. And again, doesn't matter what software you use, doesn't matter how you work, this applies across the board. This is just common sense clarity that I don't see very many people talking about. Okay, so if I challenged you and made you think a bit, that's good. And if you end up being very comfortable with where you are, that's great to have the reinforcement that you're doing it right. Uh, if I aggravated you, I apologize. I didn't mean to. I meant to make you think, but I didn't really try to tick you off. And if you took one thought away from here that you can apply by three o'clock this afternoon, I'd be absolutely thrilled. That would be great. Okay. 
we are coming up uh, 20 to one. Uh, I've left, uh, I hope, a good amount of time for questions. And if we don't have any, we can all go have lunch. But uh, why don't we just find out if there are any questions? Oh, you've got plenty, Alan. We won't be eating anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, first one is from Daniel. Should I rewrite my reports, keeping in mind that the report will likely get passed to a contractor at some point who needs more technical information? Great question. Uh, short answer is no. Um, the slightly longer answer is a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is, by the way, you can also provide a punch list report out of most software. So if you're going to give it to a contractor, don't give him all the description and limitation crap. He doesn't care about that either, by the way. Give him a punch list of defects to cure. Now, secondly, the reason you don't want to give him more technical information is because you don't want to tie his hands and you don't want to take the liability and responsibility for tying his hands. And by that, I mean, don't tell him how to fix the problem. Tell him the problem and it needs to be fixed. Don't tell him what kind of shingles to use, how much insulation to put in, what kind of vapor barrier to use, how to install waterproofing, um, what kind of breaker panel to install, how many circuits it need. Don't get into spec writing. It's a slippery liability slope. If the guy's a professional contractor, he knows how to fix the problems. That's what he earns his money doing. So I'm gonna say, this is a classic example of what I said at the outset. Home inspectors by and large have a passion and that passion is to be helpful. We care, we're sincere, we wanna share our knowledge. And those are such noble goals, it's wonderful. The problem is it gets us into trouble. And I think in this case, it probably won't get you into trouble. Well, it might if you get too specific with it, but it goes beyond what's expected of you. Believe me, you already have provided great value by identifying the things that need fixing. Make no mistake, we provide outstanding value, a multiple of the fee that we charge. We don't need to do more. We do plenty. Daniel, you do a great job, leave it at that. All right. Um, would reporting on the BTUs of, of a furnace help the client if the furnace is old and the buyer will need a quote for it to be replaced? Absolutely not. Um, any HVAC contractor who's willing to quote on the BTU rating of a furnace over the phone isn't worth uh, his salt. The other problem is, am I being too vague and wishy-washy? <laughs> um, the other problem is that in the northern half of North America, at least, Almost every furnace is oversized. And it's oversized because it keeps the contractor out of trouble. He's going to get in trouble if he undersizes a furnace because it won't keep the family warm. If he oversizes the furnace, it'll be inefficient and more expensive, but people will have enough heat. By definition, every furnace is oversized, every boiler is oversized. A decent HVAC contractor will do at least a back of the napkin heat loss calculation and say, hey, you've got a 100,000 BTU furnace in here. We can replace it with an 80,000 BTU furnace that will cost you less up front. And with the improved operating efficiencies you're going to enjoy, you will save money every year from there on. Let me give you a firsthand personal example. I bought a house and still live in it in 1985, and it was built in 1921. It had a 400,000 BTU input gas-fired boiler. It now has a 155,000 BTU gas-fired boiler. And I have added 1,000 square feet to the house by finishing an attic. And it also heats my domestic hot water. Less than half the BTUs heating a bigger house plus providing domestic hot water. That's why you don't just give them the BTU rating. All right. At the beginning of an inspection, if the water supply is shut off, would you inspect the plumbing anyways if the agent calls the owner to get permission to immediately switch it on? If the water gets turned back, sorry, the, the way I heard the question at first was, would you inspect? 
go ahead and inspect the plumbing if the water's off? The short answer to that is no. But now if the question is, you arrive at the house and the water's off, but somebody turns the water on, and I say that advisedly, somebody turns the water on, not you, somebody turns the water on, then yeah, I would go ahead and inspect it. So if the agent is speaking to the seller, I would have the, if the seller wants to instruct the agent to turn the water on, go crazy. And then I will inspect the plumbing system as I always would. Now you're, you're not gonna know whether the water heater works probably because if the system's been off, the water heater is uh, gonna take a while to deliver hot water. But with those limitations in mind, I would say yes. Okay, um, Jamie Dunsing says, thanks Alan, have to run, we'll watch the remainder later. Great presentation. Thanks Jamie. Um, do any of your inspectors use a body camera? No, or perhaps not yet is the right answer. Um, so a body camera, like a GoPro or something like that, that records the whole inspection, um, COVID-19 might have changed the world on that answer a little bit. Um, it depends what the purpose is. If the purpose is for liability mitigation to prove what you said and what you didn't say, I'm not sure, I've got 16 guys out there in the field wandering around. I'm not sure I'd inflict that on all of them to cover my butt, to be honest with you. Quite frankly, we don't have a horrible experience with claims. And so I'm not sure the cure wouldn't be worse than the disease. The other thing is if you're using it to give your client a video, um, A, I'm pretty sure you can't afford to take the time to edit it professionally. And secondly, I don't think there's a chance in heck that a client is gonna watch a two hour video of their home inspection. I might be wrong and there might be some that do. So I guess my short answer is it depends. Depends on what you're going to do it for. If you're if people are no longer going to allow, and, and we do a remote consultation. We haven't been doing inspections for the last couple of months, but we do remote consultations um, where the client actually has Zoom set up on their phone or digital device. That's not a home inspection, by the way, so don't confuse the two. But it's not a home inspection, but we can provide probably 60 to 70% of what you might learn in a home inspection and give people a, a rough big picture. And you can go through, but we wouldn't ask the client to watch that at the end. We watch it and create a, uh, a short summary report out of it that hopefully is elegantly clear and simple. So I would still, even if you're gonna shoot a video, I would still create a report that is easily digestible for the client because watching video is a lot of work to me, and especially long ones that have a lot of what I might call dead air time. So not sure I answered the question. I tried to approach it from a couple of different perspectives. Yeah, Alan, um, so he, he responded, um, he was asking for liability purposes. Oh, okay, sorry I didn't let you say that instead of giving the long answer. No worries. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Sorry, I need to scroll back up. Um, if a furnace is beyond the typical design life, is it okay to recommend it to be safety checked? I would say it's always okay to have every combustion appliance safety checked. We are, let me give you a broader answer to that. And I'm not sure, again, I might have, um, I guess the question is implying or I'm inferring that older appliances are more likely to have safety defects and that's true and that's fair. Nonetheless, I find a lot of newer appliances also have safety defects. So what we recommend is for combustion appliances and that includes furnaces, water heaters, gas fireplaces, etc. we recommend an annual service contract. And we do that for two reasons. I want somebody to check it every year and I want a contract set up because I don't trust the home inspector to remember or the homeowner. I don't I don't trust the homeowner to remember to do it. So we talk about a maintenance contract that covers your combustion appliances. And I think it should be every year, every appliance, irrespective of age. So I guess my answer to the question is yes, and then some. So I'm kind of going beyond the question to answer that. All right. Um, is it important to include the type of contractor that they should contact to perform the task needed for the deficiency found? Absolutely not. I would stay away from that. I would say what we, we use the word specialist 
or if you like qualified specialist, I do not want to recommend a downspout contractor. Um, I don't like recommending handyman because that somehow speaks to somewhat amateurish to me. I stay right away from that. Um, if clients ask, I will often send them to associations. I don't like, um, and I think it creates liability to recommend specific contractors. So recommending people to um, associations, roofing contractor associations, for example, wrecking them, recommending them to the uh, the uh, the aggregators, the home advisors, the Angie's List, uh, the porches of the world, uh, and so on. That they can help them sort out exactly what they're looking for. But again, uh, I think you run the risk of uh, of being wrong or too narrow. And sometimes it's just hard to find the right definition. So uh, I would, I'd stay away from that. All right. Um, this is a comment. If I don't indicate that I've inspected every item, how does the client know I inspected it? And how do I make sure I haven't missed anything? Your uh, required item system will make sure you haven't uh, missed anything. And do you really think the clients wonder if you checked everything? And if they did wonder that, do you think they would believe you when you just checked a box on a form? Does that mean you actually checked it or does it mean you checked the box on the form? To me, it's not a very solid guarantee of performance. The guarantee of performance comes from your experience, your testimonials, your referrals, your ability to still be in business over the long term. Having a client do a quality check on your report, I don't think is a very likely scenario. And I can tell you over 42 years, we have never performed a kind of report where we check off something for every item in the house. If it's fine, we say absolutely nothing about it. And again, I this is this is a great example where my philosophy differs from a lot of state philosophies, a lot some association philosophies, some franchise philosophies, some corporation philosophies. I understand and appreciate that, and I don't under, I don't expect everybody to agree with me, but I my responsibility is to tell you what I believe and what I think and what my experience is. So I'm sharing that, and I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. But I, I just do not do that, and I don't think it hurts your clients to leave that out. Okay. Um, can you include a link or a location to find one of your full reports? Yeah, if you go to carsondunlop.com, there's sample reports on it. Perfect. Um, does Horizon Software have a commercial inspection module? Yep, but I don't want to do a commercial, but yes, it does. Okay. Um, let's see. Would you recommend Would you recommend something such as Home Stars be advisable or more toward union professional organizations? So, uh, for some of the audience, Home Stars is a uh, a Canadian organization, and I might say the analogy might be Home Advisor or Angie's List, um, and so that or uh, a licensed professional. Um, I don't have a problem with either one, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the world is moving to uh, the aggregator lead generation folks, uh, and I think they're getting better and better at what they do. Um, the advantage of those is they're far more accessible and easy to find than the right professional licensed uh, specialist. So the homeowner most homeowners are daunted by trying to find the right uh, specific advisor. And so the value of these other organizations is it's kind of one-stop shopping and you can get quotes from three people from one destination. So it's less work and more convenient from the client. Not necessarily better, but I think convenience trumps exhaustiveness in today's society. So I'm okay with either one. Okay. Um... Is there ever a situation where you would recommend replacing an electrical service panel based on age, such as a 50 to 60 year old panel? 
short answer is yes. Slightly longer answer is it might depend on the condition. It might depend on the brand and what I know about its history and so on. So there are a few nuances to that question, but uh, yeah, mechanical devices, uh, wear and age. Um, I might also come up with a hybrid recommendation when it's older than you've seen or it's a brand that you're not familiar with. I might recommend that you have a qualified specialist, meaning an electrician, check the panel out, make sure connections are tight, that the breaker mechanisms work and so on. Uh, as a home inspector, we can't be flipping uh, breakers on and off during inspections. So if it's questionable to you, further evaluation on that one. I'm not a huge fan of further evaluation, but on something like that, I think it may make sense. So re recommending flat out replacement of old stuff, I usually hesitate a little bit because I'm old and I don't want to be replaced but also because sometimes older is better. I'm, I'm gonna tell you something outrageous here. Knob and tube wiring is so far superior to the crap we use today, it's criminal. Knob and tube wiring's got this horrible unsafe reputation, and yet it's heavier gauge, better wire, way safer because the black and white conductors are separated by six inches. It's superior in every way. We went to the new modern wire because it was way cheaper to install. It only took half as much labor. So older is not always worse by definition. So a bit of a, a cautious answer on that one. All right. Although you are not going to use all the photos, do you agree with taking lots of photos to help you remember everything about the home? No. I want you to collect everything that's important about the home before you leave it. Uh, so it depends what you mean by lots of photos. And I guess my first, the, my interpretation of that question when I heard it was, I'm not gonna look all that closely at the house. I'm just gonna go through, take a bunch of pictures. Then I'm gonna go back to my office and then I'm gonna look at the pictures really closely and inspect those. And I think as I say those words out loud, everyone would agree that doesn't make much sense. The reason I want you to inspect thoroughly and take photos as appropriate is because as you're looking at things, as you're going through the house, you'll see something that will make you wonder about something. I mean, the very first slide I said, we do a lot of deductive reasoning and we're dealing with incomplete information. So when I see a stain on a ceiling, I wanna know more. I wanna know what's in the room above that stain. Have I run the plumbing fixtures yet? Is the stain wet or dry? Those photos that I take when I go back and look at them after to make sure I do a good, all I'm gonna be able to say is, oh, I see a stain there on the ceiling, but I can't do my investigative work. I can't do my home inspection work and provide the best answer I can for my client. So I'm gonna say, take photos of the things that you need to because you have looked at them. Don't take photos so you can look at them later. All right. Um, Alan, what is your opinion regarding recommending recommended qualified specialists versus licensed specialists, electricians, plumbers, et cetera? I'm getting away from licensed because licensing is a county state thing. Good for you. I 100% agree. The word licensing does not belong in there. And by the way, all the people that you might ever recommend not all of them are gonna be licensed. So licensing doesn't even apply all the time. And quite frankly, in my jurisdiction, a licensed general contractor means that he paid a fee and has insurance. Doesn't mean he knows what he's doing at all. Licensing in some instances is a proof of competence. It's why we have replaced, but not always, it's why we've replaced the word licensing with qualified or just specialist. And again, with the understanding that a specialist knows what they're doing. So the, the license, and does it need to be a master plumber? What kind of license? Um, I stay away from that, and I'm glad to hear you say that you've stopped using the word licensing. I agree with that. Do you test on-demand generators? No, uh, is the short answer. Slightly longer answer is generators are beyond the scope of the inspection. So if 
I was going to inspect it, it would be done one of two ways. It would be done as a separate service outside the home inspection, or it would be done as a courtesy and disclaimed extensively in the home inspection. Um, does it matter to your client? The answer is yes. If people have a generator, they want to know that it works. However, if I go a step further, my client doesn't care if it works during the inspection. My client cares that it works when the power goes out in his house. So I'm going to say testing it during the inspection has some value. But what has far greater value is a strong recommendation to either have a service contract set up on that generator and or to ensure that the generator has self-checking circuitry, auto tests itself and runs on a regular basis to make sure it works, has an alarm system in it to make sure it doesn't work. The, those occasionally used emergency things need attention when there's no emergency and most of them don't get it. That's what's important about an emergency generator to me is providing the homeowner with the tools that they can be assured it'll work when they need it. During the inspection, they don't need it. So I don't test them and I don't apologize for not testing them. And I explain it's outside of the uh, uh, purview of a home inspection, but I think that's really solid advice to give with extremely low liability. It's also the right thing to do. All right, and this will be our last question. Um, is it okay for inspectors to inspect sewers or should they leave it to licensed plumbers? You are welcome. When when they say sewers, I'm not sure. Are we talking a private waste disposal system, like a septic system, or uh, the sewer line going out to the street on a municipal system? Um, so here's my answer in either case. I just have to think whether there's any qualifiers between the two. Neither of those are within the scope of a home inspection. So I would say you would not do it. I would say that you can do either or both, meaning a well and septic inspection as an additional ancillary service, uh, either for a separate fee, well, let's leave it at that, for a separate, so, and with a separate agreement, by the way. You can also uh, integrate it, and what we typically do uh, is we work with the company and we do offer a video sewer scan. In the city that I live, we've had lots of uh, municipal sewer backups. So, uh, and we also have lots of old houses with mature trees in the front yard and uh, partially collapsed and clogged main drains. So we recommend that service and we will arrange it for clients, but we don't do it ourselves. And it should never be represented as part of a home inspection. So I would say never as part of a home inspection. If you want to offer it as a separate service, do so with those constraints that uh, separate fee and separate agreement. And then your other option would be to uh, recommend that that work be uh, outsourced to a specialist. And you may choose to take on the responsibility of organizing that specialist or not. So a long answer, but the short answer is don't do it as part of a home inspection. All right. Thank you so much, Alan, for the insights and practical advice on report writing provided today on the webinar. As a reminder, this and all presentations of the series are being recorded and are available on the ASHI Online Learning Center that is free to all ASHI members as part of membership. Please allow one week after the webinar ends to access on the portal. In addition to these webinars, there are over 140 courses and technical and business subjects available to ASHI members. You'll receive two ASHI CEUs for participating in this webinar and will receive a certificate stating that after this webinar ends. There will also be a short four-question survey. Please take the time to respond. Our next webinar presentation in the ASHI Education Expo series will be the Mechanics of Garage Doors and Operating Systems for Home Inspectors by John Wessling tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Time. Please remember that each webinar needs to be individually registered for, so please register for that one at ASHI.org to participate. Thanks again, Alan, and thanks to everyone who participated today. Have a great rest of your day. James and Mike, thank you. Have a great day.